everyone. I'm Jill Brown, Director of Public Programs at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. Thank you for joining us for today's program, Guns and Hate in the Coronavirus Era, presented by the museum with Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Joining us today is Robin Thomas, Executive Director of Giffords Law Center. Robin has served as Executive Director since 2006. She supervises the organization's work drafting and defending safer gun laws, as well as educating legislators about evidence-based gun policy. Prior to her work at Giffords, Robin served as the Executive Director of the Tikkun Community and Tikkun Magazine. Before entering the nonprofit space, Robin practiced law in New York. She's a graduate of Duke University and the University of Miami School of Law. Also with us today is Jordana Gessler, Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. Jordana has curated traveling museum exhibitions, developed several of our core education programs, and presented at conferences internationally. Jordana is a graduate of the University of Vermont, and she received her Master's in Holocaust Studies from the University of Haifa. Robin and Jordana will each give brief opening remarks and then we'll have a conversation and question and answer session. We will take as many audience questions as possible. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A section. And with that, I'll turn it over to Robin Thomas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the museum for having me with you today. And thank you to Jordana for joining me in this really important conversation. Um, I'm Robin Thomas. I'm the executive director at the Giffords Law Center. I've been the executive director here for 14 years. Um, the Giffords Law Center, um, under a different name, was founded after a mass shooting at a law firm in San Francisco at 101 California Street almost 27 years ago um, and merged with the Giffords organization about four years ago. Um, our focus at Giffords is on several fronts. Most importantly is to understand how we can pr prevent and reduce gun violence across the country by looking as much as possible towards evidence-based solutions, um, often in the legislative and policy realm. And we can talk a bit more about some of those legislative and policy solutions. We also work through litigation, so defending existing gun laws against Second Amendment challenges. Um, particularly in the wake of a Supreme Court decision in 2008, as well as bringing affirmative litigation cases to bring accountability back into the system. Uh, we also work in the political arena through our affiliates at Giffords, um, focused on lobbying and promoting candidates who are gun safety champions, um, and partnering with organizations across the country on all these fronts. Um, today, we wanted to talk about guns and hate. And I think in order to contextualize that conversation, there's a few aspects that you need to consider side by side, particularly in light of where we are with the coronavirus right now. First of all, um, gun sales are up. So just to put that on the table, and again, we can circle back to that a little bit later, gun sales in March were up almost 90% over the previous March, and in April, about 80% over the previous April. So we are looking at millions of guns being sold right now in this very strange time. And many, many of those guns, we believe about 40% are first time gun buyers. And that only includes sales from licensed gun dealers with a background check. Obviously, in many states, you can buy a gun without a background check, and so we don't have records of that because it doesn't run through our normal background check system and tracking system. So it could be even more guns that are in private hands than ever before. And one of the reasons why that's relevant is because in many cases, in almost all cases, the presence of a firearm can turn bigoted threats um, and hate crimes into deadly assaults. And that is what we look at trying to reduce across the board. Um, we believe there are approximately 10,000 violent hate crime attacks every year, um, including firearms. So firearms related hate crimes, intimidation and attacks happen 10,000 times every single year. And we know that without reducing that number, it is only going to become more and more deadly because there are a rising number of hate crimes across the country. Um, the numbers have been up last year. The numbers um, reported by the ADL, there was an increase, the highest ever recorded number of anti-Semitic hate crime attacks. 
um, last year in 2019. We don't have numbers for 2020 yet. We know that since Donald Trump took office, hate crimes against the Latinx community have increased. And since coronavirus, we know that there's an increase in hate crimes against the Asian American community. So hate crimes are increasing and at the same time, hate groups are growing. A lot of that comes through online platforms, but it's obviously more complicated than that. And with the kind of politics we have going on right now, it is really continuing to entrench um, what we see as that us versus them uh, mentality that the white supremacy groups really propagate and not just propagate the philosophy, but in our review of a lot of these websites and what a lot of these groups are saying, they really are advocating for violent action. Um, and one of the studies that we have found talks about the fact that those who are involved in a hate crime, even a low level misdemeanor hate crime, are 10 times more likely to commit subsequent violent crimes, than, and including those with a firearm, than those who do not. So you're really looking at you know, obvious indicators that we have of individuals who commit low level hate crimes and then that um, then becomes higher level crimes. It escalates over time. Um, and that is something that is both encouraged by a lot of these groups that are propagating um, these ideologies, as well as just what we understand from criminal criminal data from the information that's being collected by researchers. So with that escalation and knowing there are more and more guns available, um, we see an increase in these violent acts and we are looking, of course, for ways to reduce it. So what are some of the ways that we can look at reducing um, access to firearms by those intent on using it to terrorize in many instances or to commit actual acts against a person? Um, one of the other increases we've seen over the last several years is that it used to be more the case that you would see hate crimes um, being perpetrated with acts against property, whether it was swastika symbols or nooses or various other um, highly unpleasant and intended to induce terror symbols, but less actual crimes against individuals. And that is shifting. There are more and more hate crimes being committed against actual individuals versus just property crimes in the past. Um, so how do we approach this in a methodical way when it comes to policy? And one of the ways that we can do that is to restrict access to firearms by those who are convicted um, of misdemeanor hate crimes. The federal law right now stands that you cannot acquire, legally acquire a firearm if you've been convicted of a felony, um, if you have been convicted of a misdemeanor domestic violence offense, or if you have a very, very limited number of specific mental health um, restrictions. So, you know, there's definitely these, under federal law, these very limited restrictions, but they do not include individuals with a prior conviction for violent misdemeanor hate crime, which we know for sure is an increased um, likelihood of committing future crimes, as I just mentioned. So there is legislation that was introduced in 2017, the Disarm Hate Act, which would prohibit access to firearms by people who've been convicted of hate crimes using uh, or threatening to use violence or a deadly weapon. So there is a way to do that. And there are states that are already doing that, that are already passing legislation which restricts access to firearms by those convicted of misdemeanor hate crimes. We do have that legislation here in California. So we are, we are one of the first states to pass that legislation. It's very recent, it was just passed last year. Um, and that's an excellent way to approach it. You know, one of the things that we really look at at the Giffords Law Center is not the knee-jerk responses to who presents a risk. So there are nonviolent felonies where the individual who may have been convicted of that crime actually do not pose a greater threat of future harm with a firearm. So even though under current federal law, they are prohibited from buying a firearm, it turns out the analysis of the risk is much lower. Whereas somebody convicted of a violent misdemeanor, something like a violent hate crime, is far, far more likely to actually commit a future act of violence with a firearm. So we really are trying to understand not just the idea of what creates risk and creating broad categories that capture a lot of people who may not 
make perfect sense in every instance, but rather trying to deeply understand who are the individuals who may truly present a greater risk of violence. Um, and one of those categories is definitely those convicted of misdemeanor hate crimes. So we are trying to use that evidence to work with state legislators. A lot of times in our country, we've been able to pass laws at the state level. And when you get to a critical mass of states where the laws have been changed, it's much easier to bring those laws to the federal level. We don't think it should have to be that way, especially on an epidemic like gun violence, where you have 40,000 Americans dying every year. But unfortunately, the way that it's always been um, is often requires us to have that kind of evidence and that kind of momentum. So that's what we're working on doing. Um, I'm going to leave it there for now because I know with the Q&A we'll have a chance to come back to a lot of these questions about um, hate crimes, gun access, and the ways in which we can prevent and reduce um, those issues. And again, I want to mention that that in this time of COVID, we are seeing a lot of shifts. You know, a lot of the data that we like to look at when we want to understand what's happening, what's changing, and how can we address it from a policy level is new information. We're still evaluating, you know, we do know that gun sales were up dramatically in March and April. We do know that, it, you know, reported incidences of hate crime in 2019 were up dramatically. And we're hearing that there's an increase as well in 2020, particularly against um, particular groups. At the same time, we do want to know more. We want to understand better what it is that's happening so we can look at solutions that address the particular problems we're facing. And that's what uh, we're here to talk about today and hopefully what we'll be able to focus on in the coming months and year ahead. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Jordana and I will look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Robin, for joining us today and really coming forth and discussing such an important topic about the intersection between gun laws, hate crimes, and the current rise of hate rhetoric that we've seen um, in part due to COVID-19. And unlike the novelty of the latest coronavirus, anti-Semitism, racism, and fear-mongering have actually been had a steadfast presence across the nation and the globe. However, through online posts and pictures that we follow as many remain in self-quarantine, targeted hate appears to have gained greater prominence during the last few months of the COVID-19 pandemic, Robin, as you uh, mentioned. And I think it's important to kind of dissect and look at the connections between uh, disease, hate rhetoric, anti-Semitism, racism, uh, because hatred, fear, and targeted language against Jews and different minority groups seep out of a range of stories and opinions covering the pandemic as extremists and conspiracy theorists use this platform to bring out what many people may secretly fear or think or wonder or question. Um, the rise in anti-Semitic rhetoric in the last few months has another layer beyond the trivialization of genocide because we've definitely seen some allusions to that. Um, and that is that during the time of mass illness, fear and loss of control, people can uh, turn to buried bias tropes. And that's really what leads to creating a dangerous moment in society. And looking back at the Holocaust for, as an example, Nazi propagandists branded Jews as a biological threat to Germany. Uh, there was government-sponsored racist anti-Semitic propaganda that was excessively disseminated throughout society, uh, used as education materials that would denounce Jews as aliens or parasites or even vermin and diseased. The association of dirty rats and Jews was very common. And this ideology was actually merely adopted and perpetuated by the Nazis, not invented as many um, of their ideology was. And the propaganda between uh, or the association and propaganda between fear, sickness, death, and anti-Jew sentiment, hate, violence, it actually goes back centuries. Uh, and this is exemplified during the Black Death in 14th century Europe, when Jews were used as scapegoats to explain the sudden scary spread of a de deadly disease. And during that pandemic, Jews were accused of anything from poisoning water wells, um, to spreading the disease, and oftentimes violent massacres uh, followed that. Um, in a time of widespread uncertainty, we can see in history, and even today, where the basic patterns of life and livelihood are uprooted, it tends to be easier to point to a group perpetually seen as foreign or other or from the outside and blame them for inflicting disease instead of taking on measures of self-protection, such as wearing a mask. Um, Anti-Semitic Nazi propaganda likening Jews to rats and diseases is further contextualized 
Um, and I think this is really important because a recent report by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York came out that shows a correlation between the influenza deaths of 1918 and the growth of votes won in this critical 1932 and 1933 elections that were won by right-wing extremists such as the Nazis. So with the 1918 influenza fresh in the minds of German society, in the early stages of his political career in the 1920s, Hitler really employed the image of Jews infecting the blood of the defenseless Aryan race um, in order to amass loyal followers. Uh, the association of Jews and dirtiness was a political tool for Hitler in his effort to bolster support from a wide range of Germans. And although the true impact of the influence of 1918 can never be truly known, uh, its influence on the growth of right-wing fringe politics and fear-mongering is frightening. Uh, so how can we move forward uh, to overcome and stamp out this most recent form of anti-Semitism? Communities really need to embrace education and even more difficult and important self-realization. As we can look to history to begin to understand the symbols, words, and chants we hear at protests across the US uh, and see on social media, the real issue we need to confront is that the increase in hate rhetoric we now see reflects a community's failure to face a serious conversation and untangle this tainted strand of othering in our history. Um, as Robin mentioned, the annual increase in anti-Semitism, hate crimes and racism that the L has, ADL has tracked in the last few years, uh, it's been on the rise. And this demonstrates that we are collectively not coming to terms with the true reasons why there is a rise. Um, we're not first acknowledging the centrality of it in parts of our society, and we will be unable to educate others on the dangers of anti-Semitism, bias, racism, and hate unless we begin to look at contemporary conflicts and blind ignorance in our own history and past as Americans. Um, so I think it's a really important sort of topic that we're bringing together today, and I look forward to hearing some of the questions and hearing Robin's input and what are sort of steps that we can do to create a safer and more um, humane society. So I see there's some questions coming in on the q and I'm not sure um, if Jill, if you want us to maybe go through those or if you want to start elsewhere, but I'll let you take our lead. Yeah, we have a few audience questions and I'll encourage others to add questions. I have a few, maybe a question for each of you and then we'll go through the audience questions. Um, so my first question is for Robin. Robin, you mentioned the, um, the role of white supremacist groups and um, the fact that they are uh, recently advocating violent action as opposed to just spreading their, their ideology. So my question is, as, as far as we know, do most people who commit violent hate crimes act alone, or are they influenced by a group or actually affiliated with, with one of these groups? And a corollary is, wh who are these groups? Which groups pose the biggest threat of violent hate crimes in the United States? So it's sort of a mixed bag. You know, a lot of these groups um, that exist used to be on the dark web and now it's very, very mainstream. You can find um, information about these groups. You know, they sort of tend to have two fronts. They have a public front and then they have sort of a private group where they communicate. Um, but it's easy to find them if you can find it on uh, YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or you know, any number of very common public platforms now. Um, and, you know, once you get to those groups, they sort of propagate a certain ideology. Sometimes it's anti-government, sometimes it's a sort of pro-white supremacy, and sometimes it's libertarian, and sometimes it's um, anti-Semitic. It just sort of depends on the nature of the group. Um, and most of them tend to really focus on um, pushing in a direction where you can, you can create a separateness. So there's this idea that the current American society as it's going, as things are moving, um, is, a, is the wrong direction and that they have to either push society in the right direction through a variety of tools or that they need to separate from existing society and create sort of this idealized separate society. Um, 
you know, lately I've been reading and hearing quite a lot about the Boogaloo movement, especially because there was a recent shooting um, of law enforcement by some members of that group. Many people will remember the shooting at the Emmanuel Church in Charleston. Um, that individual was involved in some hate groups and some white supremacy groups. Um, what happened in Charleston in 2017 was also connected to um, of many of these hate groups that are working together to either do group activity. So the march in Charleston was obviously a group activity. Um, but what happened with the shooter in Charleston was that that group was encouraging individuals to act as a lone wolf. So to take action um, sort of to the streets, but to do it as a lone wolf so that it couldn't be, you know, traced or tracked or um, stopped because sometimes large group activities are easier for police and others to find out about and stop. So I think, you know, occasionally you do have individuals who read the literature and are completely disconnected from these groups and go out and commit these acts, but more often they're involved with the groups and just because they act alone doesn't mean they're, they're distinguishing themselves as separate from the group. Um, so essentially that's sort of what we've seen. Did I miss, did you have a first question that I missed in there? Was that? I think, I think you answered it. Yeah, so I would say this, you know, it is, um, there's no, there's no monolithic face to hate groups. There are some trends and similarities that we see, but ultimately groups like the ADL and the Southern Poverty Law Center, Southern Poverty Law Center tracks about a thousand hate groups across the country. And some are more focused on anti-Semitic activities or anti-Black activities or anti-LGBT activities. So they have different um, targeted groups often, and sometimes there are groups that basically target them all. It just depends on um, where they're coming from. And, you know, many of you may see it, even at these protests that we've seen at state capitals during COVID, many of them by armed protesters, you often do see Confederate flags and swastikas. I mean, these are very common symbols of these hate groups, and they've become emboldened during this Trump era. Um, you know, the president referring to them as very good people or fine people has really emboldened and a lot of these groups to be more out there than maybe they were in the past. And we've been tracking incident, armed incidences of protest at state capitals. And there's a huge 500% increase just in the last few months in those incidents. And again, many of those are being stirred up on these, um, either these sites or within these chat rooms and groups of, of hate groups. Thank you. Uh, Jordana, a, qu a question for you. We've you touched on uh, incidents in history of minority groups being, being blamed for uh, crises and, and the spread of disease. We've seen a number of anti-Asian memes and messages circulating in recent months blaming Chinese and even Asian Americans for the coronavirus. Um, how, how does this echo uh, instances we've seen in history of scapegoating minority, scapegoating minority groups? Yeah, I think that um, you can see in history, not just in the US and not just in Germany, but, or not just in Europe, but when there is this moment where people are having their normal lives uprooted in sort of a fearful way, and when diseases can oftentimes be misunderstood, um, there is this fear mongering effect that takes place, especially coming from leaders who want to use it for political gain. Um, as we saw a little bit with Hitler's rhetoric in the 1920s, if you look at his speeches, there's a lot of connections between associating Jews with diseased uh, animals or vermin. And that's very much connected to the influenza in 1918 and the numbers of people who died. And again, talking about the Black Plague and even today, you can see that people use it to their advantage to create sort of this group that is responsible um, instead of coming to terms with the reality of what the disease is and sort of the ways that we can all come together to defeat it. And I think in moments of crises, there's a decision that's made and it's whether to work together or kind of um, go separately and uh, point fingers and blame at others. And that comes from misinformation uh, from knowledge that's not fully fleshed out and from not understanding the true scientific facts of what's going on. And it's very, very dangerous. I mean, it's playing oftentimes on preconceived notions and amplifying the wrong voices uh, during times of 
a strike. So there are a few questions um, on the issue of whether people should be arming themselves. You're paint, painting kind of a bleak picture of a society where hate crime is on the rise. Um, we have more crimes against people, not ju just against property. So I'll ask first, Robin, what's your response to this? Why is not the solution for people to arm themselves so they don't become victims of hate crimes? And then I'd like Jordana to address from a historical perspective and looking at the Holocaust and other genocides, is it effective um, for people to arm themselves as a way of uh, preventing genocide and de defending themselves um, in those situations? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so this is sort of a, there, this has a simple answer and then it has a more complicated answer. And the simple answer is that um, you do have a second amendment right to own a firearm in your home for self-defense according to the Supreme Court in 2008. So if that is something that you feel would make you safer and you want to do for personal reasons, you do have that right. I will say that the research shows, and this is research that's been proven over and over, that if you have a firearm in your home, the chances of someone in your home dying from that firearm are exponentially higher. The, the chances of anyone in your home dying from a gunshot wound is exponentially higher than if you don't have a firearm in your home. And that includes suicide, homicide, accidents, you name it. Um, so if you do choose to have a firearm, you should at least be aware that it doesn't actually make you and the people in your family safer in truth. It may feel better because you feel that you have a way to defend yourself, but actually it's an incredibly high risk of having a firearm. So at a minimum, we strongly suggest the most responsible firearm ownership. Learn how to use the gun properly, learn how to store it safely, make sure it's out of the hands of children, those who have um, you know, mental health crises, which may um, you know, lead them to hurt themselves. There's, there's so much risk associated with a firearm that if that is a choice you make, you must do it in a way that's responsible or you're increasing the risk. Now, taking sort of another step back beyond just sort of that basic risk, um, you know, I don't believe that the way we fix violence in our society is to propagate potentially more violence. The more guns that exist in any community or in any state, the higher the rates of gun violence in that state. So the states with the most guns have by far like five times higher, 10 times higher rates of gun violence than states with less guns. So just on its face, if having more guns made everybody, quote, more civilized or safer, you would see the US with the lowest rates of gun death and gun violence in the world because we have the most private gun ownership. But that is not the case because for so many reasons, it doesn't work that way. Again, whether it's suicide or accidents, whether it's escalation when it comes to conflict, when it's domestic violence, there's so many reasons why having more guns actually increases our gun violence rates. Um, I want to just point back to something Jordana mentioned earlier, which is the way we need to deal with things like hate crimes, th things like increasing violence and threat in our society is to understand those root causes to really get at education, connection, the way in which we undermine that basic problem that's creating more hatred, more disconnect and more violence. Um, I don't think more guns in more hands is what's gonna fix the problem. In fact, I'm 100% certain it will not. But I try to keep the facts and the statistics away from what is a personal, Jordana mentioned, you know, people feel scared. They're out of control. The society feels like something we don't understand anymore. Everyone's looking for something to grab onto that helps them feel safer, that helps them feel like they have more control. And for a lot of people, um, ooh, what is happening? Sorry about that. Um, technology. So, you know, for a lot of people, that's guns. That's why we're seeing such a tremendous increase in people going out and buying guns right now because they're scared. And we just hope and pray over the next month months and years that that doesn't lead to an increase in gun death rates, which is what we have seen in the US over the course of the last several years. It went from about 33,000 a year to about 40,000 a year over the last two years. So um, I'm not sure that perfectly answers the question, except to say that we do understand and appreciate you know, how fear-based gun purchasing seems to be operating. And we're, we're not getting into that sort of psychology debate, but there are facts that help understand what the risks are. Thank you. And so then, Georgiana, the question to you, is it true 
uh, that the Nazis um, took away guns from, from the Jews in the 1930s or prevented them from owning Jews. And did that in any way contribute to, um, to the Holocaust? So I definitely have heard this question before and kind of the assumption that or the implication that unrestricted private gun ownership can prevent genocide from occurring. And of course, the assumption is that a greater availability of weapons um, would then allow targeted populations to, to be in a better position to defend themselves. But this, that's really just not a given. Um, there's really, when you, for example, if you look at the Holocaust, but also if you look at many other genocides, it's targeting a small, percentage or a minority group within a larger country. And it's really sort of difficult to believe that people in that community being armed would prevail over a better equipped or better trained government forces that are sent out to, to mass murder them. So it's kind of, you know, what can a German Jew with a gun do against a Nazi army with a tank, sort of that mentality. And when you do look at the history of gun ownership in Germany, Gun ownership was actually banned outright for all German citizens in 1919. So there wasn't even really sort of a culture of gun ownership to begin with. Um, there was a revision of that law in 1928, so before the Nazis came to power, but it was still very difficult uh, for people to get permits to own, sell, or carry, or even manufacture firearms in Germany. Uh, the Nazis did use the extent of the law to, when they came to power in 1933 to prohibit German Jews from owning guns, but again, it was difficult for any German um, to own a gun. And then the Nazis did go out and repossess any weapons that German Jews or other groups that they considered undesirable um, owned. So there was this, and you can actually do, you do see in movements um, before genocides that oftentimes there is a, a gun removal of, remo of taking guns from targeted groups. But I mean, when we're talking about gun control in the US, it's not synonymous with gun confiscation. Like that's, those are two very different topics. And furthermore, when you talk about genocide, um, there are 10 stages of genocide and the ninth stage is murder. So there are so many other steps that come into play in moments that um, are part of something like genocide, which seems like a very simple word when we throw it around, but is actually incredibly complex. Uh, and there are many stages that go before the actual murder where by the time you get to the stage nine, somebody having a gun to defend themselves is not necessarily going to prevent the genocide from happening. And of course, I mean, there are many uh, genocides that have taken place where guns were not the primary weapon. And I think most notably is the Rwandan genocide. Uh, there have been studies about how machetes were used more often than firearms for murder. So I just, I think that it's really complicated and sometimes dangerous to make that assumption that more guns or gun ownership will protect um, a group targeted for genocide. Um, I, I just, there's, there hasn't been a correlation that you can show me truly in history that could prove that point. Uh, thank you. We, ha we have a few questions um, related to the Black Lives Matter movement and use of firearms by police. And Robin, I'm not sure if that's something that Giffords takes a position on or collects data on, but a few people are asking, what about police officers who misuse their firearms, um, particularly against the Black community? So we have a basic position at the moment, which is that um, police violence is gun violence. Um, it, there's no way to separate out violence with a gun from other violence with a gun in this country. And we do track generally those numbers. Um, I believe it's about a thousand shootings by police officers um, against civilians, some armed, some not armed. Um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting topic because police community trust, which is sort of what sits at the crux of a lot of what's happening with violence in impacted communities and communities of color um, affects 
different aspects of gun violence. So when you have communities where there's strong police community trust, where law enforcement is well trained in de-escalation, where there's neighborhood policing, where they work alongside community groups, um, where they utilize what is now understood as very effective intervention efforts for violence prevention, um, you have not only much lower rates of gun violence in those communities, but you also have much lower rates of police involved shootings, both by police and against police. So really taking a step back from the violence we're seeing, you know, so prevalent right now and, and, you know, these um, taped shootings and in, in these events that are happening across the country, um, there's this underlying question of how do we um, reform police in a way that makes everybody safer, that makes these communities safer, that makes unarmed civilians safer, that makes law enforcement safer, because it turns out they're all part of the same dynamic. Um, and I do believe that is going to require us as a society to take a step back and look at a few different aspects of policing, right? Everything from the way in which that police community trust is built and, and advocated for, including what police are armed with and how that is handled. I mean, the over-militarization of police um, is an issue, and that's in part because we have a propagation of weapons in our society and a lot of law enforcement um, departments are trying to keep up with that rather than figure out how to de-escalate that. Um, a lot of it has to do with the way in which we give liability and accountability within police departments. And that's a really complicated question. I'm not sure I want to go, although I am a lawyer and I, I have worked in the criminal justice system, I'm not sure I want to go too far down that road, except to say that there needs to be better tracking and accountability. There needs to be systems where we understand better um, how law enforcement officers who commit wrong acts are held accountable. And here in California, we actually passed a law last year which changes the standard by which law enforcement use of force is judged. Um, and that actually now is a much higher standard that law enforcement has to meet when they show um, use of force. So it's sort of a built-in accountability that all officers and all departments are held to now in California. So there's a lot of ways to do it. I think the defund police movement is tricky because I think it's less about sort of defunding on the whole and just having less law enforcement, which, which does scare some people because they wonder how to handle the situation that we have. But really that's not what most of the defund movements are about. Most of defunding has to do with allocating resources, which is now being spent on officers on the street, to the kinds of support services within communities that are actually needed, whether it's mental health services, homelessness services, domestic violence issues, where law enforcement is being dispatched to deal with. And, and the number I heard recently was that 90% of 911 calls are nonviolent issues that could possibly be handled by other social services than law enforcement in a way that would de-escalate problems. So I think it's more about shifting resources in a way that serves communities as opposed to over police, what's being called over policing and under protecting of those communities. And I think um, that's a really, really an overdue important conversation for us to have as a society, especially with the amount of money that's being spent on, you know, traditional law enforcement approaches that aren't working very well in many places. Thank you. Um, Jordana, we have a question moving beyond our discussion of the United States. The question is, are you at all scared by the rise of anti-Semitism in places like Poland and elsewhere in Europe? I think overall the rise of hatred against Jews, um, people who are part of the LGBT communities, um, people who are black, uh, people who are considered different in any way as a problem. And oftentimes those are not isolated. So if you look, for example, because Poland was brought up at the rise in anti-Semitic rhetoric that is being heard from government officials or from the public, there's also an increase in anti-LGBTQ um, rhetoric as well and a lot of laws going against that community. And so I think in any sort of moment in which there is a rise of anti-Semitism, you will often find a rise of another form of hate, and that is a problem overall. So yes, it is concerning to me because I think that um, these are all sort of signs of a community or a society instead of understanding its history and its past, um, being hateful to other people, which ultimately will only breed continued hatred and unfortunately, sometimes violence. So I, I do think it's a problem that needs to be addressed, but 
this is not just a conversation about others. We also need to do our best to look at ourselves and our society here in the US, which is based on hundreds of years of racism. Um, these things are not siloed. Um, question for Robin. Uh, the question is, what are the best things for young people to do? And I would expand that to include people of all ages to do to combat gun violence. Well, on the big picture level, I would say vote. Register to vote, vote for candidates who care about this issue and who are willing to take action on this issue, who are emboldened by knowing that they have public support. So speaking out um, and not just voting, but being willing to pick up the phone and call your local legislators, your state legislators, your federal legislators. It's something that um, gun rights advocates have done very well for a very long time. They've always been um, for you know decades now, very, very politically active. They show up to their local city council hearings. They show up um, to, to other hearings. They make those calls. They lobby their legislators. And when legislators only hear from one side, they're much more inclined to either stay silent um, or vote in a way that speaks to what they think their constituents want. So learning how to get a little more advocacy and activity around this is a hugely important part of it. You know, young people tend to be one of the lowest voting demographics in the country and shifting that could help us on so many issues, not just on guns. So I would say start with a little bit of willingness to find out who is your local city council. You know, when I go and testify now at the federal level, um, it's incredible. The difference, I testified in 2007 after the Virginia Tech shooting, and then I testified in Congress again in uh, last year in February um, on the background checks bill. And the difference at who was in the room and what the energy was, was absolutely incredible. When I testified in 2007, it was all gun rights activists and um, Republicans who showed up to question me. When it was last February, every single Democrat on the committee, the Judiciary Committee showed up. The room was filled with students from March for Our Lives and Moms Demand Action and Survivor Networks. It had a completely different feel. So that's changed. But when I go to local hearings, when I testify in San Francisco or in Pleasant Hill, California, um, Loke, generally, it's been the case that local um, gun violence prevention folks don't show up, but the gun rights advocates still do. So being willing to maybe show up and just speak your truth, it doesn't mean you have to be an expert to say, I care about this issue and I want to make sure my local city council or state legislator um, does what's right for our communities. So those are a few things. The other thing to do, honestly, is always, and I think Jordana's, a lot of Jordana's points would speak to this as well, is to get educated. Don't be afraid to read some articles about this, to understand what the Second Amendment actually does and doesn't mean and say and do. Because if you don't have any knowledge, um, it's very easy to sort of be bullied by those who you know, misstate the facts or misinterpret the meaning of things. And then it sort of silences people who just care about um, you know, learning and growing and having a, a, an intelligent conversation. So I would say educating yourself voting on this issue, being willing to speak out, you know, this is how we change the culture in this country. And really, there has been tremendous change. I mean, I use the example of the hearing, but we've been able to pass more than 300 laws at the state level since the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. We've passed more than 150 laws at the state level since the shooting at Parkland. So there is a huge groundswell of change happening at the state level. And we really need to push to make sure that those elected also at our federal level care about this issue. Um, we we um, endorsed on the Gifford side about, a, about 200 candidates in the last election cycle in 2018, and more than 150 of those candidates won. And those were gun safety champions. Those were people really willing to go out on a limb um, to talk about preventing gun violence. So change is there. We need to make sure that we continue to nurture and feed it by showing up, by voting, by being vocal. Um, I didn't get into any much on the Second Amendment today, but it's really something important if you care about this issue to have a little bit of understanding of um, so that you appreciate the fact that it's absolutely not an impediment to smart gun regulation. Thank you. Uh, and Jordana, a question for you. What are the best education resources in fighting racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, et cetera? And how would you rate current school curricula on this in the United States? And where would you like them to be with anti-bigotry curricula? Uh, 
Yeah, I think there are a lot of amazing resources out there. Um, related to the Holocaust on our website, we list a number of books that are really important to understanding the relationship between Jews and non-Jews during the Holocaust. I always highly re recommend reading the memoir Dry Tears by Nahama Tech to kind of understand um, religious anti-Semitism versus racial anti-Semitism during the Holocaust and personal relationships. I think the most important thing, though, is look at your bookshelf and look at the authors. What is their gender? What is their ethnicity? What is their race? And find a way to diversify that. I think one of the biggest issues facing most of the community is that we oftentimes find ourselves in echo chambers, whether whatever our positions are. And so I just urge people to sort of think outside of their surroundings to pick up a book that's about slavery in America, to pick up a book about redlining um, in cities, to understand um, Jim Crow laws in the South, to learn about the struggle of many Jewish refugees coming to the US and then also refugees of other faiths, creeds, religions, and races. I think the best thing we can all do is diversify the voices that are being heard around us and really amplify those that we find are not being shared. And you know, I'm happy to suggest a list of books and we can follow up and post it along with this video. But I think the best and first step is to read um, different sort of memoirs and nonfiction that are from the communities that you're interested in learning about. And most of all are from communities that you might not be a part of. Thank you. Um, Robin, you, you mentioned the Second Amendment briefly. If, if you want to go a little further into it, we do have a question about what's, what's the response to um, people who argue that any gun regulation um, violates the Second Amendment? Um, I'll just start by quoting it because it, I find it's a helpful starting point. It, Second Amendment says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And for over 200 years, the courts and government understood that that referred to a, rel a well-regulated militia being part of how states defended themselves at the inception of our um, country, as well as in many ways how the Second Amendment um, was interpreted. Now that changed. And in 2008, the Supreme Court for the first time in its history held that the Second Amendment in fact does give you an individual right to own a firearm in your home for self-defense. So it's a very, very narrow opinion, um, which only ruled on an absolute ban on private gun ownership in Washington, DC. And Justice Scalia authored the opinion. And in it, he was very, very clear that the opinion was not meant to cast out on a variety of longstanding prohibitions and regulations on gun ownership. And he listed a whole bunch of them, including types of dangerous weapons, including places you can carry guns, including who can carry guns. Those things could all be regulated under the Second Amendment and viable. So this very narrow opinion and just Last week, I believe, the Supreme Court, first it had a case out of New York State uh, that it ruled on last this year and also um, last week that it dismissed, it has dismissed, first it did not grant cert in about 90 cases, which it had an opportunity to rule on to look at whether that Second Amendment right is bigger than just a right to own a gun in your home for self-defense. And then it dismissed last week 10 other cases pending before the Supreme Court saying that those laws that had been challenged on Second Amendment grounds were all being upheld as they stood. So if we're taking a, a step away from our own personal idea of what the Second Amendment says and looking at what the Supreme Court has said the Second Amendment means, the Supreme Court has created this very narrow right and has allowed for dozens and dozens of regulations of everything from um, assault weapons to restrictions on who can purchase guns to who can carry guns in public and how that is handled in California. Many counties have very strict regulations on who can get concealed carry permits, um, et cetera. So, you know, the Second Amendment matters because our, you know, at my heart, I'm a civil rights lawyer and I understand and appreciate our individual liberties and we do have one, but it's a very narrow one as it should be because I believe that the risk that is presented to our society of firearms requires us to really carefully balance the individual right against the risk that opposes to public safety. And that's why I think 
all of those regulations have been upheld time and time again, not only since our founding, but particularly in the last 12 years since the Heller decision. Um, it is important to understand that though, because I think those that advocate for gun rights believe that the Second Amendment should have absolutely no restrictions whatsoever, that anyone who wants it, any kind of gun they want, anywhere they want to carry it should be able to. And that is hard for me to imagine the kind of society that that would create for us. So um, it is a it is an important distinction. And I think one that isn't isn't always what it seems on the surface. And there's lots of great writing about, you know, certainly the gun rights folks are frustrated, I think, by the unwillingness of the court to expand the right, but it is where we stand. So um, uh, on a different topic, we conceived this program as a discussion um, in response to the coronavirus pandemic and the quarantine we were all living under. And in, in the meantime, um, events have shifted yet again. There was the killing of George Floyd and the protests in response and um, demonstrations and looting. And I think a lot of people see these images on their screens and in newspapers and they're afraid when they see um, images of you know people looting and setting fires and no sign of police responding. and. Um, we hear the president talking about, you know, Antifa being a threat. Um, and there's this, you know, situation in Seattle with, that's getting a lot of attention. Anyhow, I think this is giving rise to this question, um, which is, is Antifa a hate group? And is it okay for them to be walking around urban cities carrying assault rifles? If you could comment generally on, um, you know, what should we make of these images we're seeing? Um, should we be worried? and and what, what can we do about it? I'm gonna let Jordana speak to the question of Antifa being a hate group. That's not my understanding of it, but I don't know enough about that in particular to speak to it. But I will speak to any group carrying assault weapons openly in the street. And you know, it would be my opinion that that there's no group that should be carrying weapons that are that dangerous, that are that were created as weapons of war to kill the maximum number of people in the shortest amount of time, that are weapons that are almost exclusively used in mass shootings across the country, um, that having those kinds of weapons being carried by untrained civilians on our public streets, um, that that's appropriate. It's not only intimidating, it's intended to intimidate. It's not just terrorizing, it's intended to create terror. Um, and that's inappropriate no matter what the group is. It's exactly what we've seen at these state capitals and some of the protests against the coronavirus restrictions. And the intent is to intimidate our duly elected representatives, which to me is an astounding um, upending of our democracy. So I don't believe, that, I don't even believe civilians should be able to acquire those weapons at all. And even if there is some amount of those weapons that are in private hands, they certainly shouldn't be able to be carried loaded or publicly um, on streets where people can can feel that terror and could get hurt. So that's my um, opinion generally about anyone, but I'm happy to let Jordana speak to Antifa and, and where they fit in all of this. Yeah, there's definitely been an increase, I think, in scapegoating Antifa um, in a way to divert attention from the real issues that have erupted around the murder of George Floyd and also the murder of many other black men and women across the country. And I mean, it's interesting because Antifa isn't actually even a unified organization to begin with. And I think this, this in a way connects with what we were talking about earlier at the beginning of this talk with this sort of unknown fear and creating an enemy that's not really visible um, because it's not a united or, um, organization. It's kind of this like loose ideological label for, um, a lot of left-wing radicals who believe in using uh, street-level force to prevent the rise of what they see as fascist movements. So it's actually an, in its, at its core an anti-fascist movement. Um, and I think it originates in the American punk rock scene. Um, but I, I think overall it's very dangerous to scapegoat full stop um, because you're really distracting from the real issue. I mean, do I think that violence is okay? No, I don't think violence is okay, but I think that blaming 
sort of, or just laying blame at one sort of organization is not going to be beneficial for our society and for our community. So I guess that's the, my long answer of saying, I don't think that um, Antifa is a hate group, mostly because it is not an organized group. Um, I'm sure there are people who are part of it who could be racist. I'm sure there are people who are part of it who could not be racist, as is with almost every other group um, and organization. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes left. I think I would just offer the floor to, to both of you if there's anything you'd like to add um, that you haven't covered um, yet, and then we'll bring this to a close. Um, well, we covered a lot of topics today, and I think when we started this conversation about um, having a, a presentation and a discussion, the question was, you know, particularly because it's for the Holocaust Museum, how does the increase in hate, hate groups, hate crimes in America overlap with the increase, particularly recently, in gun purchases and gun ownership and the way in which the presence of guns makes um, hate crimes and, and hateful um, ideology even more threatening and, and terrifying to those that it's, that it's intended against. And I think, unfortunately, we're, we're seeing a moment right now where, I don't know, emotions are high, people are scared, um, things seem to be getting a little bit worse. And, and that's certainly not the message I want to leave you with, because the message I want to leave you with is that we actually can solve these problems. We, we can reduce gun violence, we can reduce hate crimes, we can create um, a more peaceful society in which we live. In fact, there are many parts of this country where we're already doing that, where there are much reduced rates of hate crime, where there are much lower rates of gun violence. Um, it does require a bit of a transformation and we are seeing that transformation at the state level. So we're seeing in places where there's political will and interest, there's a very um, complex, nuanced conversation about how to address these problems and how to fix them and it's working. Uh, we need to have that conversation, not just across the country, but also at the federal level. And I'm also very hopeful that when it comes to the federal level, things like gun violence and hate crimes were really sidelined issues, sort of third rail issues for a very long time. And that is no longer the case. So this is a set, these are central conversations right now that are being had across the country and in Washington, DC. Um, and includes many of the topics that people brought up in questions. So the hopeful, um, and I want to leave you on is we are bigger and stronger as an organization than we've ever been. We're having more success in the last few years than we've ever had. And we're seeing opportunities across the country and in Washington that we never um, have seen before. So we have a huge amount of hope. We're excited to see what this next election, election cycle might offer up in terms of opportunities to make change. And we're really looking forward to digging in on a lot of these things, including police violence and looking for solutions that work so that we can move forward in a better direction. And thank you so much everyone for listening in today. I know your time is precious and Jill and Jordana and I really appreciate you spending it with us. Yeah, I mean, I think Robin said a lot of great things that let us close the conversation, but also leave it open for all to us to explore and educate ourselves and others. Um, I am glad that she also says that she remains hopeful because I do as well, considering that social inequity and injustice has plagued our society for hundreds of years. And in recent days, weeks, it has really been at the front of the conversation. It has been moved into, you know, being a, pi a bipartisan issue and really whether it's voters or state legislators or federal government officials. I think we're now looking at ways to bring a community get together and to make a more united front across the U.S. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm also very hopeful that we can continue to do that and continue to better educate ourselves and others in order to stop um, hate crimes and also violence against specific groups of people, whether use of guns or not of use of guns. I mean, it's all really, I think, something that we want to work against. Um, so I also remain hopeful and again, thank everyone for joining us for this conversation and um, really just so grateful to Robin for sharing such important information and enlightening us also from a legal perspective on what sort of our rights are as US citizens. Thank you, Jordana, and thank you, Robin, for uh, 
for your time, for your vast knowledge, and for sharing your insights with us today. Um, I think in a short period of time, we covered a lot of important material. Um, before we close, I want to let everyone know that while the museum remains closed, we are continuing to provide content like today's program that you can access from home. I encourage you to join us next week on Tuesday, June 30th. We're hosting a talk by Holocaust survivor Gerda Seifer. And the following week, Tuesday, July 7th, join us for a special conversation with Holocaust survivor Ernie Gross, who was liberated at Dachau in 1945, and Don Greenbaum, who served in the US Army and was one of the soldiers who liberated Dachau. Both men now live in Philadelphia, and we're thrilled to have them join us via Zoom. And next month in July, we'll be hosting our annual Tyholtz Holocaust Remembrance Film Series. This year's theme will be the Holocaust in Italy, and we'll be screening several Italian films, including The Garden of the Finzi Contini's and Life is Beautiful. You can find more information about all of our virtual events on our website, lamoth.org. Thank you again to the Giffords Law Center, to Robin Thomas and Jordana Gessler, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Take care, and we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>